Hey everyone, this is Ben and Nora in the Midwest Model Shop. Whatever you do, don't skip this intro. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Midwest Model Shop. So first and foremost, uh, we have a promotion that we're doing before we get going here. These cool shirts that we're wearing, uh, Nora and I bought from shopcallforfire.com. Now I've talked about this company before, but today we're doing a big promotion for them. They did not send us these shirts. We, we ordered them direct from their website. Nora wanted this really cool, I want my MRE shirt uh, in red. They didn't have it in red. I reached out to them, they quick changed their order set up so we could get that. I got my little howitzer army shirt here that I really like. Uh, I'm pushing for these people because this is a great veterans organization. I served for almost 13 years in the Air Force Reserves, and I had a very posh military career. I was very fortunate. These individuals, and a lot of my friends that I've been making lately, have not. These are individuals who had a lot of good friends that paid the ultimate sacrifice for this company, country, and there are individuals who have come back home that aren't the same as when they left anymore, both mentally and physically. And we're doing everything we can to help these types of individuals out and stay together, you know, enjoy each other's camaraderie. And promote their businesses. And promote their businesses, yeah. And Shop Call for Fire is one of them. So make sure you go and check out their website. We are doing a promotional code that is will give you 10% off any other purchases. The promo code is Bullet Magnet. So all you gotta do is go pick out uh, your shirt, your coffee mug, um, your coasters, your cool t-shirts, whatever it is that you want, put in that promotion code and you'll get 10% off. And even if it's too much for you to do right now, if you could just go to their website and do some browsing, that will really help out with their metrics. We'll make sure that we'll provide a link down below that you could just click on and go straight there. All right, now that we also have Winnie on the camera, I want to talk about how you can participate in this build with us for the Titanic. A while back, one of my Instagram viewers had a really cool idea that I dropped by Nora, and she said we should do this. He offered to, um, he said there is a Jack and Rose figure that you can paint and put on the ship, and he offered to do that, to paint it and send it to us. <laughs> and and I, it gave me the idea to have people send us painted figures not just Jack and Rose, um, but painted figures, all the people to, to put on the ship uh, once the build is complete. Yeah, so here's what we're gonna do. If you would like to paint a 1-200 scale figure for the Titanic and have it end up on this build, and I will videotape it and I will show it off and put it up close and give you full credits for it, uh, send me an email at the Midwest Model, the email address is themidwestmodelshop at gmail.com saying, yes, I'd like to send you one, and I'll send you uh, the shipping address to a P.O. box where you could paint your figure and send it to us. This build isn't going to be done right away. There's no big rush, but what we'll do is in each video coming out, when we get these, we'll go ahead and show off each one of these. Now, there was, I think, oh man, how many people were on the Titanic? Like 2,000 2, something? Yeah. I have over 21,000 subscribers as of right now. So, uh, if each of you sends us one, that's too many. Someone's got to stay. <laughs> that's not going to work. There won't be enough room on the raft at that point. So, uh, also, if you're watching this video in the future, i.e. you're seeing this like two years from now, it's, it's over. Don't send don't, anybody. Don't send anything. <laughs> uh, and that's also why I'm doing the email. You send me an email, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll send you the address, ship it to. Once we get... If we get a ton of these things, we're going to have to cut it off. If we get none of these things... We'll just make our own. We'll just have to make our own. <laughs> and it's okay. It's not a big deal. But we thought this way, all of you who would like to participate, you can. So get a 1-200 scale figure. Drop me a line. The Midwest Model Shop at gmail.com. Also, if you have any questions about anything modeling related that you want to ask me about, that's where I interact with people all the time. I get lots of emails with lots of questions. And I, I do my best to help everybody out. All right. That being said... This episode is all about getting the hull ready to go and paint on it. So yeah, let's let's dive into the build. All right, first order of business is to drill out all the portholes. The larger portholes need a pilot hole to guide the drill bit through. So we've got this little device. I'll show you kind of how I made it later. The idea was from Nigel. Uh, he came up with this, and basically what it does is allows you to center a pilot drill bit into the hole for the larger portholes. And then Nora's showing you here, you just fit the thing in the middle, you get the drill bit started, 
so that you got a hole started, a pilot hole started right in the center. Here, I'll zoom in right where she's working. And what that does is it allows you to get a perfectly centered pilot hole going. So when we come back later with our, yeah, with our larger bit, let me zoom in on that. Voila. Yeah, voila. When you come back later with the larger bit, we can easily drill out uh, all these portholes. So anyway, uh, real quick here, I'll show you kind of how I made that out in the shop. And we'll get all of our portholes drilled out here. Thanks, Nigel, for the tip. We really appreciate it. Pressing on. Okay, so here's how we went ahead and made the, uh, the little jig. It's basically just a half inch, or no, I'm sorry, three quarter inch piece of aluminum rod. I uh, stuck it in my metal lathe out in the shop, and we're just going to go ahead and clean up the sides, face it, and basically put uh, a divot on either end. Now, Nigel went ahead and pointed out in his video, he didn't give any dimensions, that you need to get calipers out and you need to measure your kit to find out what size the window holes are. Because as the Titanic is made, uh, the molds get tired and those tolerances change. So from one person's kit to another, uh, they're going to vary. So get your calipers out and, and kind of figure out for yourself. I'll show you here on the two different sizes that I came up with for the windows. Once we get this going here, we get our calipers out and just keep working it down until we get to the right dimension. So that's our small one. It's like, I think, 80 thousandths, 80 thousandths and a half or something like that. There you go in the window and then uh, flip it around put it back in the chuck and it's the same piece of metal we're just gonna make the larger dimension here on the other side and this works out to I think I was going for a hundred and seven thousandths and we got like a hundred and eight it worked out really well So the last step to do in the machine process is just run our hole through the middle and you're all set uh, what I don't show here is there's some sharp edges on the thing when I'm done, later on I end up sticking it back in here and putting a bevel on the outside edge because it's easier on your fingers when you're going ahead to use the thing. So anyway, that's how I made it and yep, back to the model. Right, an ongoing effort to drill out holes, I've got this kit from Union Tools of uh, these nice small machine drill bits. Anyway, they are there's one, the green colored one, is just the right size, and no, I'm sorry, it's not numbered for the really small bits. And we have it in a drill bit, and or chucked up in a drill, turned to low speed, so it doesn't melt the uh, plastic, but it fits right in the hole, and just like that, you can drill it out. And I'll sneak up here, I'll let Nora drill one more, and I'll show you. Okay, I'm going to come right in over the top, and as you can see, so it focuses, it's drilling a perfect hole right all the way through. So, we're doing that for the holes that are really easy that you can't screw up. And I'm doing a magnificent job. Yes, you are doing a magnificent job. <laughs> Alright, pressing on. Okay, so we're using a pin vise now. We're back to this, back to the basics. Why? Because I snapped the other one right after I talked about how I was doing such a magnificent job. <laughs> Just one of them? <laughs> no, two. Uh, Who's counting? Nobody. <laughs> it's all right, fellas. We need the write-offs. Th this is working. It's working just fine, right? Yes. More, That's all right. We're going to order... More time-consuming, a little more tedious... But it works. We're going to order some more of these. Uh, I need them anyway for... these. This is the bigger set. I have a bunch of smaller ones that I used quite a bit on the Missouri. So we'll place another order. Because it is faster if you can use a drill. You just got to be real careful with them, right? Yes. They're very delicate. They are. All right. Pressing on. Okay. Uh, I know I took a close-up of this set and it wasn't really helpful. Uh, this is what I use, Drill Bits Unlimited, and I ordered two of these sets. I was using them on the Missouri because, as you can see, they've got a lot of really, really small bits. And I ordered this bigger one um, that you could probably use and be helpful in the Titanic. Anyway, I'm going to pick up some more of those, but I want everybody to see real quick that this is the Drill Bits that I use. 
All right, while we're on the subject of drilling our portholes, as we start to come around the stern, what you'll see here is the portholes get elongated, and they're not nice and round like the ones up here. The reason for that is this hole should be perpendicular to the hull plate, right? The porthole should be like this, but the mold came out straight away from it, and that's how you end up with this funny-looking shape here. So what we're going to do is fill this up with putty, and once it dries, I'll come back in with the drill bit, and we'll drill our portholes perpendicular to the hull plate, like you see here as we go along. So that's just a little detail that we want to tidy up. So we're going to fill that with putty, let it dry, drill it out. Quick little update to our window hole drilling process. It's been a few days, and uh, the putty dried up here, so I went ahead and drilled my holes for these portholes that we have so far. Uh, what I'm going to do later is paint over this in a light gray so we can actually see how well they all turned out. On my kit, interestingly enough, I want to add up here in the bulwarks, see these light gray areas, the rectangle ones? Those are actually supposed to be cut out, and on both sides in the back here, they're semi-transparent. Mine had a little bit of uh, carryover, and so I'm going to be uh, cutting those open so that they go straight through. Some photo etch goes on the back side. You're supposed to be able to see straight through here. It is correct on my kit all the way up here on the bow. Go all the way back here, and we got to fix it. So I'll be cleaning that up as well, but I wanted you to see uh, what we had done here in the back. We have to address, um, there's supposed to be more portholes. These are supposed to continue around in the back, and there's hull plating and stuff here that's missing. We'll, we'll sort all that out, but yeah, uh, almost completely done with the port side hole drilling process. All right, here we are at the stern of the ship. Now, m all of the portholes that come with the ship, the standard ones, have been drilled out uh, to the matching size, and I want to talk about what I am and am not doing here in a little bit. On the back of the ship, however, you're missing four portholes, and I've made a little X's here to indicate where they go. The reason for that is the same reason that these portholes right here are all elongated. This is the center seam of the two mold halves that come together, and you just can't get, you can't pull the mold apart. The mold comes apart that way, and the holes go perpendicular to that. So you're going to have to put them in yourself. I just used uh, one of my reference books, found a nice picture of the stern. I went off the center line, um, used a pair of dividers, and just kind of eyeballed as close to matching the picture as possible. Uh, what kind of gap you've got there because these ones in the back here are actually kind of close together and then they they get spaced out like you have here on the side so anyway just mark those out do a good job get a little pilot hole and drill those out uh, and then we're going to talk about some other things okay so uh, all the portholes are drilled out and as you can see they're all I mean, I think they look good. We're not done with them yet, but this is this is the initial stages of getting the hull set. Uh, I don't have big, huge pieces of photo etch metal on here. Some of you are going right away. Ben, there's corrected portholes and corrected rivet patterns, and you could buy this photo etch kit and put it on there, and you can correct the side of the hulls. I don't care to do that, unfortunately. Uh, part of the reason is I just... I don't count rivets. No offense to those who do count rivets and want your model super accurate. There's nothing wrong with that. I just, for me, it's I'm not seeing the value in this particular kit in doing that. But if you do that, that's fine. Uh, I highly encourage that. I'm going to go with the stock holes, though, which I think a lot of people are going to go with. And that being said, in the back here, uh, we've got our four extra holes drilled right here. And I want to talk about uh, this stern area here. So, there's no, the, the hull plating that you get, I've marked out with pencil so it shows up better uh, on camera. This is, these are the lines that um, Trumpeter gives you, okay? And so, what you can see back here, and definitely like right up in there, it just kind of ends. And the reason for that, again, is the same reason why there's no, no port holes back here. The hull halves have to come apart 
during the molding process. Now, up here along this, the center line of the keel, Trumpeter could have bothered to put one or two more lines here, and they didn't, and I don't know why. So what we're going to do is correct this. Now, first of all, uh, there is a photo etch kit a gentleman makes in the UK that you can buy. It's fantastic, absolutely superb, where you just uh, follow his instructions, and it's photo etch metal, and you, you glue on new hull plates. And it will fill in it's the correct pattern, and boom, you're done, and you're ready to go. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with back up here, though. We're not going to do that because, again, uh, that costs money, and there's all kinds of data on this stuff online, and I also happen to have thin sheet styrene stock that one could just cut out. So we're going to see about cutting this pattern out and making it ourselves, which you can do, too, because... I don't know how cheap this styrene is. It's just super thin stuff. I, I bought a big sheet of this like five, five, six years ago. And I still have it, and it was like three bucks. Super affordable. Uh, the other thing I want to show you, let's, let's look at our reference, one of our reference photos here uh, near the bus on the starboard side. This isn't the best photo, but right here, see that line that comes down and curves around right here? and wraps around it's prominent in other photos I want to I want to put that on here because you, you can see that so I've penciled it out it's neat we just need to you could do it with, the, with a piece of styrene or you could engrave it uh, I might engrave it and then maybe remove a little bit of material bumping up next to it here but just it's just a little detail that will help liven up the whole rear end uh, and we will be addressing the rudder. The kit rudder is way wrong. It's, it's not even close to being accurate. And we bought a new one from Shapeways. So we will be correcting that. We'll get to that point down the road. But moving on next year, uh, we're going to address this issue. I know some of you thought I've already spoken too much, but that's okay. This video is probably not for you. All right, pressing on. Okay, here's one of my reference photos. This is the back of the Olympic and as you can see, lots of hull plating going on here. Lots of neat stuff to do. So, what I did was I got some paper out and some stuff online, and I, I created this pattern. Basically, this is, a, this is a piece of paper that fits in this big blank space like so. I looked at the reference photos, and it's not perfectly accurate, but as best as I could, created a pattern that fits in here like this to replicate that hall plating. Now, it doesn't take care of this area right here where it just kind of transitions to nothing. We'll address that after we have all this in. Uh, these plates, there, there are lines here. That's why I've drawn them. There should be one more, I believe, before the Titanic nameplate goes back here. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and cut some stuff out like that that fits there too. So, you can do this. It really wasn't that hard to create a pattern and uh, use the reference information and, and get this on here. As you can see, this line right here, this piece, doesn't exactly match what the Titanic's got, uh, the trumpeter has, but that's okay. This piece right here where the uh, rudder post goes into, uh, this is all wrong. This is totally wrong right here. Um, I don't even know if you can see it very well in the photograph, but it looks something like that instead. After we get this together, we'll address that to get it the best we can. No, this is not 100% accurate, but it's better than nothing. You can do something like this yourself. Uh, you can make up your own pattern. You could try and emulate this one. I think it's a good idea. So the next steps would be, probably what I would do, I've made several copies of this, would just be to cut out every individual piece, throw it on some styrene, and cut it out. Uh, we're going to try and do something along those lines. I'm also going to try, though, something a little more advanced. My wife has a Cricut, and it should be able to scan this. We should be able to throw a piece of thin styrene in the machine, and it should conveniently cut all these pieces out for us. I'm going to give that a try and see how it works. All right, so uh, I went ahead and put this little edge in here that I talked out or about earlier. All I did is I ran an X-Acto knife, very sharp, point straight down in, followed my line, and then I used it like this to cut 
up into my line and then scrape along here to clean this up to get this nice little edge. Uh, in the book, The Titanic, The Magnificent, they talk about um, this hub for the whole uh, rudder right here. There's actually instructions to say this piece needs to get put in and then riveted high up in place first before the uh, plate above it goes on top of it. It's pretty cool. Right over here, I've added this little piece of styrene. Um, according to my resources, it may stretch all the way around to the front right here, but I'm not going to worry about that too much and get caught up in all those particulars. I know it, it generally speaking goes in here, and it was a riveted plate. So I just stuck that piece of styrene in here, and I've got my little awl tool here. And I'm just going to take some time and put some rivet dents in this piece. So we've got something here to look at. And I'll just go ahead and put this all the way down. And then we'll duplicate this on the other side. Press it on. Okay, we're in my wife's studio. Over there is the Cricut Maker that she's got. She's going to come down and show us what to do. But basically, here's our regular cutout. And I took a picture of this. We uploaded it into the software. And the idea is... It's kind of like, here's the sheet styrene. It's kind of like printing it on a piece of paper with, and we'll put a sticky back on it. But instead of printing, what it's going to do is cut out each of these shapes uh, so that I don't have to. Or at least we're going to try it and see if it works. So for starters, Nora suggested that we actually just have the machine draw it out to get our size right. So this is the Cricut what it does it just pulls the piece in out that green mat is the sticky thing i said before we actually stick the paper to the mat it holds it in place uh that allows us to do our little test drawing uh this was allowed us to work out the size for all of our pieces and everything and make sure that it worked out correctly so then after that the tool on the right is actually the knife and here's our piece of styrene stuck to that green back and it's really hard to see in this shot, but what it is doing is cutting out our individual pieces. And we set it up to do several cuts and get all the pieces set up uh, individually so they're easy to identify. This didn't cut all the way through. We had some trouble with that, um, getting it dialed in, but it was fine. It totally scored the material about three quarters of the way through and made it super easy to remove, which you'll be able to see here in just a second. Okay, back on the workbench, we've got our pieces basically cut out. I'm pretty sure you can see here are the general shapes. Uh, this ended up being kind of a long process, and uh, with some refinement, it could get to be a lot easier. But this works for me. So they're all cut out. They're generally speaking the right shape, and they're all just slightly oversized, which is perfect for two reasons. One, I can dial them in to get the exact shape that we need. Two, they're supposed to overlap. Remember this plate would go down first and then this is the following plate. This back edge would overlap this piece and we want to allow room for that. So by having them a little bit oversized uh, we could start working that into position. So let's let's start cutting these out and installing them. Okay, so we're underway. I started with this uh, top stern piece right here and we do want to replicate uh, these the layered effect that you got going on here so what I did is I, I cut out my my next piece and I'm just gonna I'm doing this on camera here but I'm just gonna tape it into position and what that's gonna allow me to do is get this piece out and I'm gonna glue it into position right like so so that we can then get rid of this piece. And now we've got a staggered step there. And we'll worry about filling this in later because they're not, they're not all flush with one another. Um, it would be nice if they were, but, but they're not. That would be kind of like, if this was the case, we could just score all these lines in and it would be fine, but we're trying to stagger it. So anyway, uh, just a note there, I don't have this all sorted out but we're going to start working back and forth like that across and see kind of how we end up here. And we'll have to taper and do some sanding, I think, on some of these to get the look we're after with everything. But this is the approach I'm going to take here. Let's, let's make a little more progress. I'll show you where we're at with that. All right, so here we are. Uh, we've got this 
piece of hull plating on and we want to put the next one going towards the bow moving forward this is on the starboard side so since this area right here is recessed for the time being I want this part to be raised so I'm going to try and show you this with this piece of tape I've got my next piece and if you look right here I want to overlap about a 32nd of an inch and if we could do this without it sliding around too much here got my piece of tape I'll just stick it down so you guys get the general idea. All right, so right here we have our overlap. And then I kind of want to dip down, so we're going to use some heavy-duty cement to make that happen. And then right here we come to an end, and we meet the kit overlap piece of metal. So the idea in the kit here is that this plate comes up, lifts up over on top of that plate. Though it means... I need to sand this down, probably starting in here. Definitely this edge, all the way out to here, we'll fade it from here forward uh, to almost nothing so that we get the lay that we want. Up here, after this is glued in place, it's got a pretty significant step, not as high as what's simulated on the kit here. So we'll sand this down a little bit so it's not so dramatic. So let's get some. Uh, glue in place and uh, come back to this piece installed. All right, this next piece is glued on. I pre-sanded right up here at the top first to kind of get it down almost completely flush with this raised rivet piece. And right here, hopefully you can make that out, we've got a nice raised edge. Uh, let's take the sanding stick and we're just gonna take a little bit off of it here so it's not quite so dramatic with the rough, and then we'll switch to the blue. I'm sure you guys are just watching my finger there, but uh, you get the idea, right? It goes just like so. And then we've got this flat edge. Man, I hope this is showing up in the camera. We've created, let me move this. All right, I think you can see this a little bit better now. I've created basically a flat spot right here. There's that hard edge. So this is this is flat, and then it dips downhill. And then right here we've gone almost to zero. There's a little tiny gap right there. And I might fill that with a little bit of putty uh, after I prime all this and see how it looks for the plate transition. But, I mean, we're fussing, I'm fussing over details that no one will notice when this kit is done. Uh, but we want to get them halfway right, at least. Um, and so we'll take a look at that. So anyway that's how this is going to proceed along. So I plan on moving along here with this next plate, like so, as we come around here and meet up. Uh, we'll leave this gap here and figure out how I'm going to handle the rest of the plating in here uh, next. So, yeah, let's, let's make some more progress. You guys get the idea, and uh, I'll show you where we're at next. And we're back. This is what I've accomplished. Uh, got basically all of the plating in. So what I realized was, like in the pictures, like it's reset, raised, recessed, raised, recessed, raised, or something along those lines. And I thought, wait a minute, I don't have to put these all in. I think I mentioned that before. I could skip some. So that's what I did uh, to simulate these plates right here. This one, and you can see it there, I needed a, a lip right here, and then I needed it to transition down. So I put this on, and I've sanded this down to basically zero. Uh, when I get some primer on here, I'm sure I'll still see a transition, and we might end up putting a little more putty on here or doing a little more sanding to try and get this to smooth out to nothing as best we can. Uh, this plate right here, looking at my reference pictures, I cut this curve out for the rudder post to go in right here, and hopefully that works out right. What I haven't done yet is, oh, so, and this plate came along here and it fixed this area. Uh, Trumpeter had it so that this plate line came down to right here, literally stop and just come straight across, if you recall from earlier. So having this plate come across and then right here fixed it. Then we've got this giant plate right here. And it, I'm, I'm looking at my reference photos and I don't think it went this far. I think that there was actually two pieces here. So when I, I got to go to work. Uh, I have to get ready to leave right now. What I think I'm going to do is create a piece that sits on top, overlaps here, runs along, and I think I'm going to end up right in here, short of this window, 
I don't, I gotta be mindful of these two seams or we might end up short and go like right up like this. I'm not sure. I gotta double check it. This, this seam is messing me up. And I know, no, not all of this is accurate thanks to Trumpeter. So it's forcing me to have to figure something out. Maybe the solution is gonna be just run the plate straight down here. Do a short one. That way this goes every other and the pattern matches. But we're fairly accurate back here. And now we've got um, hall plate installed. Uh, i got to put these pieces in. We'll start with here and then go this way and overlap them a little bit. Uh, some of you will have noticed that I'm missing my portholes here. No problem. The holes come through from the other side. So I'll, I'll drill those out. They'll come out on this plate and we'll have that back installed. And yes, I'm very pleased with this. It's starting to look good. I mean, there's there's... When this is all painted up, it's it's gonna be like, oh, there's there's plating back here like there's supposed to be. It wraps around. So that's it. Uh, we'll put probably a piece right along here. I think just a flat piece of styrene stock, uh, like so, and then have it roll up onto the belly like that is probably what we're gonna end up doing. I say that looking at my reference photos. In uh, the book, The Titanic, The Ship Magnificent, there's a picture showing all the hull plates. And this looks to be pretty accurate in terms of simulating what you would have seen here. Once the ship's uh, where it's supposed to be, really just, there's one piece of plate here that rolls across and then it disappears. You don't see anything else. So, all right, that's it. Pressing on. Uh, let me go to work. We'll come back next week and get more done. Okay, it's next week. Uh, so port starboard side here I went ahead and made this piece of styrene up plate it goes to zero here basically and we're gonna lay it right on top like that uh, it should fit in uh, above once it's pressed in a little overlap there like you want to have and then it ends here now the only problem is this this piece of plate doesn't actually show up going on top and what I think I might do I'm going to glue these two in. I made made reverse, so it'll go on the other side. I might take a little thin sheet of styrene and place it on this lip to simulate the bumps like you see right here. Because that's all Trumpeter did. They just, it goes from zero suddenly up. And we want to try and just kind of keep it all consistent. That's, that's all we're trying to do here. So let me glue these into position. And then, as you can see, I think that'll conclude our plate correcting back here. All right, uh, it's been a minute since I've done any kind of modeling tips. So I put this place on and I pre-sanded pre it almost down to zero. And there's still a little bit of a lip right here. So I'm going to grab my blue sanding stick. I'm going to use the darker blue um, grit and get some, some on here. And just go like so and sand it down to zero. This, this is not the tip. Okay, so... That's a lot better. Uh, you can see right here where we actually skip over. There's nothing being done, and then we've got our little scratches. Flip it over to the light blue to try and smooth everything out. Okay. So then obviously uh, wipe all that off of there. We still got some scratches left right in the light gray, and keep it in focus here. You should go to the white sanding sticks. You know, you get progressively um, higher grit or lower grit, and you can uh, eliminate the scratches. But that's kind of pain in the rear. If you just grab your pencil at this point, you take the eraser and rub it like so. You'll buff those scratches right out. It goes nice and smooth real fast. And a pencil eraser is a lot easier, a pencil is a lot easier to hold than a sanding stick and almost all of those scratches are gone. So anyway, that's my tip. Instead of using the white sanding sticks for the final one, just be lazy and go to the pencil. All right, press it on. All right, this piece is in and I put my little faux plate right up in there. Uh, it looks really well. It matches what the kit's got going on here. Now, I realize that not all of this is 
super accurate. I did the best I could looking at my references, page 158 of the Titanic, the Ship Magnificent book, and this plating pretty closely, as best as I could tell, matches. I mean, it's not as pointy here as maybe it should be, but I'm pleased. The rest of this is really in an attempt to match what Trumpeter has done so that you have some cohesiveness going on here uh, between the kit and, and correcting what they didn't do. Uh, up at the top here I added my little plating that you'll see just barely from the side like this and it'll roll off to nothing. Uh, right here the uh, this is the port bus wing will be sticking out so you're not going to really see this. Uh, I did add this detail. It's worth noting in the reference photos that this plate right here curves as it comes off of the stand for the um, or the molding for the rear uh, rudder assembly. And then what I am going to move on to here is so we've got these plates that come around. What I've done is added these lines, this one and this one. I drew them in pencil. The rest of these are penciled in because I just drew them so that you could see them on the camera. These are engraved. They're, they're just slot in. Uh, I realized that on the ship itself, these plates just butt up next to each other. There's no overlay. So there's no real point in putting new ones on here. So what I'm going to do instead is rescribe these so that they're a little more prominent. Now, it was frustrating to figure this out because there's this little triangular deal at the end. Uh, I don't really think that's supposed to be there. I think that this plate just kind of covers this whole area, or these two plates are supposed to come aft a little more. Regardless, uh, we're going to go ahead and just um, rescribe these lines to a little more prominent and scribe these two. They do go land in between these two portholes right here, and the idea is that the I went in the Pontos kit and got out the Titanic logo and got that spacing right because Titanic should stretch from this line to this line. That's how I figured out where to put those in. So uh, we're going to scribe those lines in here next and then press on to the next part. There's so much I could talk about in this section here in terms of accuracy. Uh, it's, it's not. <laughs> I mean it's, it's close. It's good enough for what I'm doing but like the center bus even See how it comes straight in and runs in nicely here? This actually should, that, that little point really should end right about here. This whole plate should curve out and have this nice transition outfit center bus. I just, you know, Trumper decided not to mold a lot of those details very accurately. But that just means we just need to figure out how to compensate for that. Is is as reasonably as we can and that's what we're trying to do so we'll scribe some lines press on to some more interesting stuff okay so looking in our reference book on page 100 we got to do the pad eyes now this is probably the olympic obviously because uh she had a problem with smashing her props into things all the time and getting rear-ended and all kinds of terrible stuff happening so they had to pull these off a lot so pad eyes uh are used to lift well, it says right there, lifting the rudders, or the, um, sorry, the propellers off, and so you can swap them out. Now, here's another picture of the Olympic, and you can see that right here the pad eyes have been removed. Uh, you can also see, if I zoom in here, there's kind of like a flat bottom and then another little one on top, and that's, I'm sure, all for the rigging. So I wanted to try and depict that. So here they are on the ship, and I just cut them out of little sheet styrene. I opted to put the three in here and uh, the rest along here that are missing from the Olympics pictures. This is the Titanic. The Olympics a different ship, so we have to speculate. Now, they're a little out of scale. They're a little big, but these things are so teeny tiny, it's just really difficult to get them any smaller. Uh, I might regret this decision to put them on right now because we have to rework the rudder, stern post, and all this stuff a little bit, and they might get knocked off, but I made them from scratch, so I could just make more if they fall off. But there's a look, and I think they're pretty cool. And then, you know, when we get zoomed way out on the ship and everything's painted black, they're, they're probably going to mostly disappear. So again, this is just kind of that eye candy that you see as you move in. Uh, and then 
my scribe lines worked out really well up here. So now let's take a look at the rudder. All right, so it's time to move on to the rudder stern post area. So this is the kit provided rudder. Uh, it just, you know, goes right in, fits like it should, no problemo. Problem is, it's the wrong shape. So there's some interesting things worth pointing out. First of all, if we zoom in here, uh, what Trumpeter did do right is they included the little uh, wear plates. See that little raised area right there? I forget what those are called. They're like zinc plates, I think. Uh, you put those on, and so that's the idea is to promote corrosion of those plates. They're sacrificial versus wearing your rudder down. Um, but they do have kind of these sharp lines. These are kind of raised, and then the shape is funny. I mean, it works, but it's it turns out it's not quite right uh, in a lot of areas. So here we have our rudder that we got printed from Model Shapeways. Uh, it is significantly thinner than the kit provided one. And as you can see, these little parts are called gungeons. I think I'm saying that right. Um, the kit one, the top hinge is on the rudder, and then they're attached to the ship. Uh, this one, they're all included. So we gotta, we got to ditch those, including this bottom one down here. It has the more correct shape. We also, you can see the top of the rudder stern post here is nice and big and round. And it will not fit up here. I am glad that I made this area round like I was supposed to. I was pretty good on my guess, but I'm going to need to go ahead and drill a hole up through here so that the rudder stern post can fit through like it's supposed to. Um, they did not have our little sacrificial zinc plates here. I'm going to say zinc right now. You correct me in the comments now, and I'll look it up later. So we'll have to add those. And But what they did do, uh, they fared, yeah, sort of. These are supposed to be fared, meaning the rudder was bolted together here and then they put a fairing compound over the top of them to smooth this out so you don't have a bunch of drag created by the rudder. What I don't like here about the Shapeways piece is it's, it's, when it printed it, you created these ribs. So it's just, it's not smooth. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and prime this up. I'm just going to get my airbrush out. I'm going to wash this piece, prime it and see what kind of condition the edges are in. We're probably going to have to do a bunch of filler sanding to get this all nice and smooth. And then we'll come back here, we'll drill the hole, we'll cut these gungeons off, and we'll take this whole thing, and we'll drop it in and glue it into place. Uh, I do like that these gungeons here, these pieces are bigger than the kit ones. I think they look a little bit more accurate to what's on their ship. Also, I will note that the bottom this bottom one here where it hangs on the ship they have a nice flat spot so you have a positive glue point to get that piece installed which is good so let's do some painting and sanding and uh, get ready to install this thing All right, start. okay uh, Nora's gonna go ahead and start cutting these off Pew. and we'll just work our whole way up and we'll come back with a sanding stick and clean this all up so there's a nice connection point uh, for the new rudder that we're putting in. You know those are nail files, right? Yeah, nail files. We'll use our nail files <laughs> to clean up the area here. Okay, we just got to get our nail files now. Voila. Voila. Okay, here we are up at the bow of the ship for a few minutes, and we're looking at where the hole should go for the hoss pipe. A uh, couple of comments. One, I, I just sanded this smooth so the seam's gone and everything. This is all the wrong shape. Uh, if you look real closely at the pictures, just starting out from straight on, it, the hoss pipe should come from about here and angle out, nice and slender. And the same down here, it should go from the outside edge, kind of come wide here, and slender down. It should be a lot more elongated. Uh, from the sides, oh, it's a mess. This whole thing needs to come and curve out, kind of like the bus, the center bus on the uh, propeller in the back. 
this whole thing needs to be cured out. Anyway, a lot of people are correcting this. Uh, I'm not going to bother doing that because, honestly, it just doesn't bother me that much. Uh, but what a lot of people are doing is they're carving this out and putting in a, a nice hoss pipe hole, which is which is really cool. But I decided to go the opposite direction. What we're going to do is we're going to put a cover on it, which is what happened while the ship was underway. Probably got a little extra cement there. Uh, I read in one book there was probably a piece of plywood. I don't know if that's correct. I would hope it could have been a piece of plywood. I hope it's something a little bit more substantial. But um, yeah, it was covered up and it was painted black. And so I'm going to do that on our ship. So we're just going to get that little piece put on there uh, to depict the ship how it would have been underway. That would have been closed off. But there would have been, you can see it in some of the photographs, a raised uh, piece of wood or something. We'll call it a cover that went on there. So that's how we're going to handle that situation. I've also shaped it to match the Haas hole that Trumpeter has elected to go with. So see how this ends right here? Make sure the camera's got it in the sight. This curve that you're seeing should probably come out to about here and work its way up and around. And if you're going to do that and you're going to mold it on out to come out like that, remember this shape right here gets molded back in. So you can't just throw a bunch of putty on here and extend this out. This, this shape of this plate goes back in there too. If you check the real ship, it's all there. Anyway, this is what we're doing. It fits the ship, pressing on. Okay, so Nora's over here uh, putting together our wing buses for the back of the ship. Uh, these are also inaccurate, but they look good. Uh, but what you could do is some little improvement. So when we go to our reference material here, uh, taking a look at this wing bus, I want to focus in here on how the trailing edge is comes to a point. You can see it's a little bit wider here where it attaches to the hull of the ship and when you glue the wing bus halves together they're just big flat things. It would be as if that corner and that corner came straight across in this big flat edge. So after she's done gluing those we'll go ahead and start shaping them and you could sand them down and then put them uh, together on the hull and uh, make everything else look nice. You know you could spend a lot of time making this ship like super super duper accurate or you could take what they give you and do what you can to make improvements and that's what we're doing here and this is something that everybody can do you can take your sanding stick out and smooth these two edges together so once they're all set up here and we got both of them done we'll we'll do that on both sides okie dokie buses are assembled and hopefully you can see the um yeah we thinned them down and I went ahead and just kind of scribed a, scribed a panel line that went straight across like that. It may not look super great, but this is just in case you end up seeing it on the model. Because it looks like, looks like there's one right there also. It's kind of the idea. Again, take, take what Trumpeter is giving you here and try and make some improvements to it. You know, that's, that's the... The gist of, of modeling, right? Now, if you want to see how to take these buses and make them absolutely as correct as humanly possible, uh, you want to make sure you head on over to Nigel's modeling bench, and he has he has a great like hardcore tutorial on how to get these things super accurate. It is not for the faint of heart. Uh, this is this is for your average modeler here. Everyone should be able to. To do this, but what Nigel's doing is on a whole new level of engineering, literally. Okay, we'll get these glued on and press on with our hull here. Okay, so early in 2020, during what I'll call the Titanic acquisition period, I get this really nice email from Commodore Urban saying, Ben, the bilge keels on the Titanic are all wrong. You got to order replacements from Model Shapeways. Back then, they only had a couple of things you could get, like the bilge keel. Uh, forward bulkhead and like the, the rudder and so I ordered those things so here's here's the kit supplied keel and it showed up and you know it's it's big and thick it I'm zooming in here so you can see it's just got this nice rounded edge it's one big long piece uh, when I look at the reference material 
uh, you come up with something different. This is this is what you get from Model Shape Waste. This nice thin, small piece. We'll zoom in on it here. There's a nice seam down the middle, like there should be, basically T-shaped keel. All right. And we put those next to each other. I mean, Ray Charles can see that, okay? So it, th this is better. Now you don't need to order these, and uh, if unless you want to, you could just take a thin piece of styrene, put a curve on it. I don't even know if I would monkey with you know, creating a T, and you could go ahead and glue it uh, to the keel. Speaking of, and when I look at this is correct per all the reference photos that I have, um, and, and I keep saying reference photos a lot in this video series, I'll keep saying that. This is, when I'm talking about references, this is what I'm talking about. So these are the books that we have uh, that we've been going through last year. So the first one that we got is a Titanic Ship Magnificent, Volume 1. This one covers all of the external parts and fittings of the ship basically. If you're only going to get one of these books I just bring it up, this would be the one that I recommend. The next one is volume two, Titanic the Ship Magnificent. This is all of the interior fittings and everything that goes on, on the inside. It's super awesome. Probably going to use it to decorate the inside of my house with. We'll see, right? Uh, this is cool. So this is a magazine. This Titanic the Truth, what does it say here? Truth about the tragedy. Truth about tragedy. So I was in Maine two years ago, I think. No. No, not even. It was a year ago. And I was coming through the airport to come home, and this magazine was just sitting on, on the counter by the register there. And I grabbed it, and it's just loaded with all kinds of stories and goodies. And it's actually, like, a really cool piece. So it's we'll, like if there were tabloids back then? Yeah. This would this would be this, it. It. this is it. So you should you should <laughs> yeah. All right. So then we got uh, what we got Titanics and photographs by Daniel Klosterner and Steve Hall. This one's pretty good. Just generic rundown. A lot of black and white pictures. I don't think they're all that great, but but they're there. There's a lot of images some, that are in this. Yeah, a lot of the images in this are kind of in all of these other books. So there's only so many. The right. So then we have the R RMS Titanic, A Model Maker's Manual. I read through that one. That's a really good book um, that can give you some up-close detail and maybe answer some questions that you are that are kind of hard to find in these other books. And then the last one, of course, is the Titanic and Her Sister Ships, The Olympic and the Britannic by Peter Davis Garner. And we'll stick it there so everybody can see. So anyway, over the last year, uh, while I was working on the Missouri and everything, Nora and I spent time just kind of flipping through each of these books and trying to get an understanding for what's going on and uh, what it was like. Yeah, what it was like back then, what was the manufacturing process, what was the feel for everything. What it was like to be there. Yeah, just to, you know, to like be... Character like character actors. Like if, Put your chin down. Be sexy. If you were there. Uh, and so that really helped us get kind of the full immersion. Be sexy. No, 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 be sexy, sexy. Of, of this experience. And so anyway, when I say uh, in my references, I found this, this, and this, it came from one of these books right here. All right, so now uh, to glue these on, they come in two parts and they're actually a little bit too long for the space that's provided. But what I've done is I've gone ahead and flipped my ship over and just put some tape to hold this thing in position. Now, this line right here represents the kit part. The kit keel would stretch from top to bottom here. You know, my initial thought is, well, let's just put this keel right in the middle. But then I realized I want it straight and I could just use this reference line right here, the top, because the ship's upside down, as my straight edge and I could tape this on here and then on the back side drop some thin CA glue down along here to glue it in position just work my way back. Well, now when I get to the back of the ship uh, the next piece and you can see it's curved I gotta work on it. If I butt this together uh, it ends up being uh, probably about three quarters of an inch too long so we'll end up cutting this probably right about there and butt joining those together so that they're the right length. But that's that's how I'm going to handle uh, gluing these things on. And if you do your own piece of sheet styrene to make this right, um, you know, this would be a good method. So anyway, let's glue on the keels. Okay, sorry the furnace is back on. Every time I go to film, the furnace turns on. I just don't feel like 
dealing with it. Anyway, that's the keel installed. It's nice and slender. Uh, I'm just using this display stand that comes with the kit to hold the ship up right now. Looks good. Uh, I put in these two pieces of photo etch right here uh, per the kit instructions. I saw online an individual saying, no, I think that these are like condenser intakes and they should actually be like way the heck up here. But then I found a picture uh, in my reference material showing them both located right here with the condenser intake being a separate piece somewhere located up here. We got to address that. We'll, we'll talk about that later. So anyway, we've got um, our plating, we've got our pad eyes, we've got our rudder, we've, we've corrected some of the uh, stuff back over here, uh, we've got our boss wings on, and we've got our corrected shape back there as best as we possibly can, not being all big, we got a nice seam along here. Uh, I did see this basically meets at like a 90 degree angle, and it probably has a little bit of a, more of a curved taper but th honestly this it fits so well I'm not gonna worry about that um, yeah and then there's our keel and then we get all the way up to the bow and we've got our little cover installed to fit per the shape of the kit if you rework all this you, you need to rework uh, the shape of your cover right there and then of course we've got uh, all of our holes drilled out for now uh, for the windows. So we can go ahead and get our first uh, coatings of paint on. The first thing I'm going to do though is instead of washing with soap and water, which you could do, throw it in the bathtub, I'm a fan of rubbing alcohol. Uh, it gets rid of all the grease and stuff that was attached to your hull. It gets rid of your fingerprints. Anything that's stuck on there, it cleans it up and gets the surface ready to go and it dries very quickly uh, and you're good to paint. So that's why I like rubbing alcohol. So I'm going to get a couple little rags or something and give the whole thing a quick alcohol bath and then uh, we'll get some paint going on here. Oh no, we had a catastrophe. Right there we're missing a chunk of our bilge keel in the midst of moving it. Somehow I like, I don't know, I my finger flicked or something bumped this and it went snapped right off and went flying away. Uh, I heard where it landed about and I went looking for it and after spending quite some time uh, trying to locate said piece so I could just glue it back into place I came up empty handed. So uh, we need to make a patch. We're going to go ahead and use this styrene. Same thickness, just this tiny little thin guy uh, just like we had before. So yeah, this stuff happens. Let's go ahead and fix it. All right, uh, just grab our little thin sheet of styrene here. It broke right where the seam line is, which is kind of nice. So I'm just going to put this on here and trace out with the pencil roughly where it goes. Get our shape right. Now uh, I've got a straight edge. I'm going to just cut this out just proud of that line. And we'll go ahead and just fit it and glue it back in. Okay, we've made our little filler piece. It's ready to go. So now I'm going to take a piece of tape and connect it right across the bottom here. Like so. And then this is our piece. fit it in there like so okay and you know this is resin and this is styrene they're not going to just stick to each other like I would like and this is a little bit proud but that's okay so now we're going to take our uh, CA glue this is the Bob's CA glue thick stuff and drop it right in on that seam there. It's all getting painted and it might look a little rough but hey every once in a while you make mistakes and this is how you we're gonna fix this one and you know on with the rest of the ship. If we do a good enough job no one's even gonna notice and uh, 
honestly, I think if you were to come and see this in person when we're done with it, once it's all painted and the whole ship's done, no one's going to notice this. So if something like this happens on your model, don't ever be afraid to just make the repair. All right, now I've got a little bit of accelerator. We'll drop it on there and let that set up. I'll give it a few minutes, and I'll take the tape off of the back. I'll put some CA glue on the back side, and then we'll just hit it with a sanding stick and merge it in the best we can and call it good and move on to paint. All right, press on. Okay, that's it. There's our repair. Uh, sand it up. It looks pretty good. Uh, there's It's smooth along the edges, and then it butts up right here. There's a lip, which is perfect because there's a lip right here along the photo etcher that seems at it. When this is painted, I think it's going to look fine. Um, you all might notice it. You know where to look. Right there. I think that, um, you know, that's okay. Bummer that it happened, but that's all right. Easy fix. So anyway, let's finish cleaning this up, and we'll move on to painting things. Okay, so to start off spray paint, we want to get basically two colors on the ship right away. I want to put black on because the ship's black, and then red. Those are the two primary colors. And you got your yellow line and you got your white up above that. So I went to the store. Here I have Tester's Enamel Flat Black Spray Paint in the cans. I got two of these cans. And then I wanted to put a flat red. I wanted Tamiya red. I was looking at the Rust-Oleum Primer. All that stuff. And everywhere I went, nobody had what I was looking for, which was really obnoxious. So I settled on uh, Krylon Pimento Satin this stuff and it's okay because what we're going to do is shoot the whole thing with the black let it set up we'll go over the red afterwards this the black undercoat will actually help darken this a little bit and because it's satin ideally I'd like it to be flat but satin uh, it won't go on too thick and it'll help us get what I like to call the starting palette if you're making your model and you want it pristine uh, perfect which you know just it's immaculate you're obviously going to want to get the right color red and the right color black that you're selling on it and put that on right away I like to call this setting up my palette and getting my base coats down we'll get black on we'll get the red on and then we'll start adjusting with a fine airbrush uh, all the little details to give the hull a little bit of life and a little bit of accent I remember this stuff was rolled on with rollers and paint brushes uh, back at the turn of the century. They didn't have fancy spray guns and all the modern stuff we have today. It didn't go on very even. Uh, and you, at a distance, the model will look good. And then when you get up close to it, you want to see some of the intricate stuff. That being said, a couple of tips about using spray cans. It tells you right here on the instructions uh, to use at room temperature, 70 degrees, and low humidity. I think 70 degrees is about 20, 21 degrees Celsius for those of you. The next pro tip, and it tells you shake it, shake it for two minutes, uh, but the, the thing no one tells you about is you actually want to warm this paint up inside of the can. So you gotta heat it up. Note it, do not expose to heat or store at temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It may explode. Now, I'll joke you aside, go ahead and get yourself a bowl, fill it up about yay high uh, with hot water, take your can, set it in it, and let it sit. Uh, heat moves one way. Temperatures in real life move one way. They move from hot to cold. Just like water goes downhill, it doesn't go uphill. Temperatures move from warm to cold. That's why we actually can't get to uh, absolute zero because you need something colder than absolute zero to bring the warmth below that and we don't have that. So anyway, that's the way this works. If you set this in here, um, it's not going to explode. Give it about five or ten minutes, and what will happen is the can will warm up. You can also hold it under the sink uh, and with hot water on it if you want. I like doing that sometimes because what you could do, take my other can here, is you hold it under the water. It'll be cold to the touch. The can's cool. Shake it, and as the paint moves around, you'll feel the can go cold again because the, the cold paint on the inside has absorbed the heat that was on the outside. Obviously... Don't blow yourselves up. Don't, don't expose it to a flame. Don't leave it out in the sun. Follow the instructions. Don't get it super hot. But definitely do this. Get it, get it to warm up. Once the can's warm, shake it for two minutes. And what you'll find out is it sprays incredibly well. And obviously, you need to be in a well-ventilated area. 
Um, I'm going to just do this in my shop with the air uh, air filtration system on for my, my spray booth and we'll be fine. So anyway, that's my pro tip. Let your can warm up and then uh, go ahead and shake it up. Now it's time for a segment that I call Tales from the Titanic. This first one is going to be about Benjamin Guggenheim. Benjamin was the fifth of seven sons born to the mining magnate, Mayor Guggenheim. All of Mayer's sons were known philanderers, but supposedly Benjamin really took the cake in this department, according to one of his nephews. 46-year-old Benjamin had quite the entourage in tow when he boarded the Titanic in Cherbourg, France. Starting with his valet, Victor Gilio, his chauffeur, Rene Pernot, a mystery woman named Leontine Pauline Obart, and rounding out the group was Obart's Swedish maid, Emma Sagessa. The group spent eight months together in Paris, where the 24-year-old Obart was a nightclub singer known as N Ninette. She's also known as the last of Benjamin Guggenheim's mistresses. Oh yeah, Ben had a wife, Florette, and three daughters at home in New York City. Benjamin Guggenheim was reportedly sound asleep when the ship struck that iceberg on that ill-fated night. After being roused by a steward and told to don their life vests, he and his valet reportedly helped his mistress and maid board lifeboat number 9 at 1.20 a.m., at which time Guggenheim said, We will soon see you. It's just a repair. Tomorrow the Titanic will go on. He returned to his suite with his valet, where they are said to have changed into formal wear. A steward saw them and asked, What's that for? Guggenheim replied, We've dressed in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. Obart reportedly said the calmness on deck was unsettling and that it made it, quote, all the more terrible. The men were perfect gentlemen, calmly puffing cigarettes and cigars and watching the women and children being placed in boats. As promised, Guggenheim and Giglio went down with the ship as gentlemen. Their bodies were never found. Obart and her maid were rescued by the Carpathia and taken to New York City, traumatized and impoverished. Nanette couldn't speak English and had no money to return to France. She could no longer rely on the support of her lover, and anything she had of worth went down with that ship. She was said to have had 4,000 pounds in jewelry in her cabin, along with numerous trunks laden with dresses and hats. Rumor has it, the Guggenheims gave her hush money. So one can only assume she may do with that. Obart died in France October 29, 1964 at the age of 77. Okay everybody, so now that Nora got the hall all painted black, it's time to mark off our water line. And I just want to make a couple of comments about that uh, before we get going here. There are obvious reference points if you look in the pictures on where on the bow on the stem and where on the stern the water line was painted at or the anti-fouling line uh, technically is what we're, we're talking about here. And traditionally what we do is we make up a little jig like this, uh, however you want to do it. It's just, you know, it's a very complicated piece of wood with um, some adhesive devices also known as tape holding the pencil. And you just set it down and you run your, your line around the ship and it's a nice straight flat line. Um, you do need the ship level and not moving. So I have it sitting on the bottom, but I noticed that the ship rocked uh, when I did that. So, as you can see here, it, it, it wiggles like this and that's no good. You need to hold still. And I, even though I busted the keel, I figured out like, hey, if I just stick a wax pencil right underneath the keel here on both sides, then it it locks it into place and the center of the ship stays and now it won't rock. And that would allow me to drag my line all the way around. Okay, the issue with doing this is if you use this pencil and you drag it around, you'll get a perfectly straight line, stem to stern, it's perfect, fantastic. The problem is if you start right here, I think you can see that tape, and you mark your line and you come straight back, you'll end up going through the middle of a bunch of the lower portholes on the back of the ship. As Nora comes around here, you'll see I've already marked one side out. So, there was a great article by Bob Reed talking about that this line is actually curved. Now, curved, not curved, here's the deal. In this book right here, and you go to page 
158. There is a picture, and don't worry about seeing this up close. There is a picture here of the condenser and the water line going right through the middle of it. But in this picture, this is a perfectly straight line. I, I, put, I put a ruler on it and checked it. So one of two things is happening here. Either this drawing is correct, and it should be a perfectly straight line, and the hull of the Titanic is wrong, and we all know that technically this thing is not exact, uh, or the location of the condenser in the pictures, or some, something doesn't add up is the bottom line. So, brass tacks here. You need to put a curved line in the ship. You want to have this point on the bow, and you want to have the same line on the stern, have the red line pass through it because that's what is accurate per the pictures. But you also want your line to come below the discharge ports and pass through right here where the condenser would be. Alright, that being said, how do we do this? So, level the ship, get out your pencil, and set the pencil up to pass through the height of the condenser on both sides. Get a straight line drawn first. And here I'll show doing it on the other side of the ship. So, on the, this is our starboard side, the condenser ends up being right about here and my pencil lines up with that. The hull plates uh, have little bumps and it's actually easier to draw from the bow back. So we'll just start here and draw a nice smooth line. You hear each of those clicks, that's going over the joints of the hull plating. Goes right through my condenser point. And we come out back here on the back of the ship. And now we're going to get a quick little close-up here. I think I can just point with the pencil so you guys can easily see. This line should end up about a quarter of an inch higher, and it doesn't. Well, that's fine. So now what we're going to use, like we saw on the other side, is thin tape to mark this out. What you want to do is mark your spot right up here and your straight line and get some thin tape and mask your radius down to where it intersects the straight line that you drew. And you want to do that on one side only for starters. And then let's go back to the other side. Once you have your curve established, take your pencil, go back, and draw your line again so that you have a reference line cutting through your tape. That will give you start and end points like right about here under that, I don't know, I forget what this is, a tie off here, is where it re-intersects, and right about here is where it ends. Now you can measure where your curve is going to be so that you can match them on both sides. Through the middle here, it's, it's nice and straight and flat. Uh, what I did, this is 8th inch tape. I marked the tape uh, on the line down, and the reason I did that, so, so basically the top of this tape is going to be where the black begins. From the tape edge down will all be red. Once this line is in place, I'll come back with Tamiya and we'll show that and I will tape, I will mask to this edge and then remove this piece because we want the tape and everything below it to be red. So I have to mask above that. Hopefully that all makes sense. So that's how we get this set up. Uh, so the next step is to match, match the other side with the masking tape and then get some Tamiya on here and then we'll be ready to paint. Uh, yeah, hopefully that's all that's all clear as mud. Okay, real quick before we keep going, someone's gonna want to know, Ben, where's this condenser thing you're talking about? So, look at the back of your ship. I'm gonna come back in here slow. You've got, let's see here, you've got one, two, three patches. Go to the third one and come right down here. See those three little holes? And there's my line. Find this point if you want to match what I'm doing and get your pencil set up to pass through here. That's going to be your level line across the whole ship. And that will, if you, if you care to match it to what I'm doing here. All right, let's get some tape up. Okay, so I've got the bow tape on. 
and hopefully in this shot, I'm going to hold it right there, you can see there's a lot of symmetry. It's really, really close. That's, that's what you're going for here. Is it looks ideal on matches on both sides. So that's what you're looking for. Okay, so now we're set. Uh, what I've gone and had it done is put my Tamiya masking tape on along the hall like I described to you before. I went right on with it. This is good tape and got a nice smooth surface put down. Uh, this is enamel black paint. It's not going to peel off. I'm not worried about that. And in case you were wondering before, no, I did not use a primer. I just used a paint. If you clean the plastic with alcohol, you get all the dirt off, and you use enamel paint, it will stick and you'll be fine. All right, so now that our line's established, from here on down will be red. Uh, cutting on newspaper, and we just, we're just going to go ahead and mask off the rest of this to protect it, and then we'll get to painting. Put a piece of foam on the bottom of the ship so it's just kind of easier for us to move around when we work on it and now it's time to take off our masking that we put on. Did you know Benjamin Guggenheim is a philanderer? No. A philanderer? So, yeah, it worked out nice. Let's do the other side. Look at that. Okay. So, if you followed along up until this point, this is our palette. We will start working the black in our tones and the red in our tones uh, from here. And we also have to get our yellow stripe and we got to paint this area up on the bulwarks white uh, to get those infamous Titanic colors going. So I think that's it for now. I hope everyone's enjoyed this video. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. Winnie, are you on YouTube? Yeah. Cute little doggy B-rolls. <laughs>